Hi. All right. There. Wow. It's a lot of me. Um, well, thank you for coming back, and hopefully uh, we, can, we can make this a little more informal if you like, if you want to move closer, or we can just, we'll just go through, and there's a lot of information. Um, I'm Jen, and this is Kathy, and if you were here before, I'm a physical therapist, and Kathy's an occupational therapist, and we um, have worked in research uh, and clinics with people with leukodystrophy for more than two decades, um, each of us. So um, and, uh, Keely asked us, uh, the ULF asked us to present about choosing medical equipment. So um, we have a, like a wealth of, of like information for you about how you can go about um, picking out medical equipment or getting the resources that you need. Um, so on the first, this opening slide, I just wanted to point out different um, pieces of equipment. So like uh, on the far left, the gentleman's in a manual wheelchair, so he has to push it with his arms. Um, in the middle is like a special uh, lift that can help give body weight support for walking. And he's even wearing electrical stimulation on his leg to help him advance his foot. And then the little girl is also in a body weight support harness um, that can help give her some support so that she can exercise. Um, and what we really wanted to use this time to do, if you go to the next slide, Kathy, is to um, better understand who the people are that can help you um, choose the right equipment and who participates in helping order equipment. And then understanding why you might want to go to a specialty clinic or a specialty provider, as well as um, what's the information that you need in order to get a referral to a, uh, a seating clinic. And then really important in some like overview of what is necessary necessary documentation-wise, because we often find that um, when you're ready for a piece of equipment, it's already pretty far down and you want it right away and it takes time and a lot of different uh, things have to be in place. And so thinking about that ahead of time can be really helpful. Um, so seating clinics, uh, who's on the team and why is it important? So one thing you can see in these pictures too is in the little girl in the upper right corner. She's in a wheelchair that actually is a tilt in space. So you can kind of rotate the chair back um, and give pressure relief to um, in sitting. So that can be a really important if somebody can't move themselves um, around in a chair. Or you can see the little boy in the middle. He's in a, in a sport chair, so it's even like a lot less Less stable, so he has to be more balanced, but he can go faster and uh, participate in a lot more um, dynamic activities. And then the little girl in the far corner, she's in a power wheelchair that's driven with a joystick controller, but it also has elevation, which allows her to participate with people more at their level rather than sitting um, at a seating level. So there's a lot of different um, possibilities out there for equipment, and that's why um, going if, if you have access to, or you could go for one or two times to a specialty equipment team, you can find out more about these different um, technologies. Technologies. Um, so the mobility equipment team can include, of course, uh, the patient and their care partners, um, but also it can be a physical therapist and or the occupational therapist involved. Um, it also has your equipment supplier, or we consider them like the vendor, so the, the company that is the middle person that orders the equipment for you and then the manufacturer as well as your physician who um, helps with the ordering process, sometimes the selection process, um, and when it's the right time. So um, there are a lot of different services that a, special, like that a mobility equipment team can provide. So the one important thing is just seating systems, um, what you're sitting on, what you're sitting in, um, any wheelchair modifications that you might need um, with either changes in your ability level or your... Um, uh, you know, as you as either you improve or have a decline, pressure mapping. So a lot of times there's changes in sensation or una, inability to um, to uh, feel, and so it's really important to know where your pressure is going through your body in your seating system, um, and to be able to alleviate areas so that you don't have prolonged pressure in one area, which can cause skin breakdown and a lot of other complications. Um, and there is a lot of custom molding that can happen for seating systems, so that's something else that can be done. We can do equipment trials, so different types of walkers, different types of standers, different types of wheelchairs. Um, they can fit uh, 
mobility equipment. So it's not just a matter of like how high do you need it. You know, if you're talking about a, a younger child, you want to have it to be able to have growth to it. And so you might need to make changes to that or to a wheelchair over time. Um, there are equipment evaluations for your um, activities of daily living. So thinking like a bath chair um, or a seating, a feeding chair or something like that, an activity chair as well. And then for like a standing frame or gate, like walk, specialty walkers or gate, um, uh, gate trainers, those are other types of things that can be provided. One of the really important parts is obviously your goals or the patient's goals. And um, those usually include things like comfort or to decrease pain, um, to increase your time sitting upright um, and being comfortable like that, um, your independence, so you're able to get around within your home and perform your um, daily function that you want, uh, activities that you want to do, um, also to reduce the caregiver burden. But I'll say here, um, at the time of an appointment, really the focus is on the patient and what their needs are and even more important in documentation because um, payers will really pay just for what the patient needs and not necessarily for making it easier on taking care of them and so that's something as far as the wording goes to just pay attention to um, and then optimizing pressure distribution as I talked about like seating systems and pressure mapping um, it's really important to have good positioning for circulation and for healing your skin or maintaining good skin integrity. Um, you also want to have a good neutral um, postural alignment because this can do a lot of good things. It can make it easier to move from a good starting place, but it can also help you prevent getting, like we talked about, like decreasing your flexibility if you're not in a good position um, or having any other kind of orthopedic deformity that sort of stands for like scoliosis, think something like that, or, um, you know, a change in your in your back posture. Um, it can also help you with energy conservation, make it possible for you to get through a whole day of different activities that you want to do. And then we also help with like actually getting this equipment to your house. So um, sometimes we think about kids have equipment at the school that the school provides, but you don't have that at home and the school can't provide equipment for you at the home. So getting these things like a stander or a a gate trainer, um, a walker, or or if you need it, um, like a, a safety bed or a, or a hospital bed, those things can be also um, provided by a um, equipment uh, appointment. Um, and then there are different types of goals um, for seating and positioning depending on someone's ability. So if, um, if you're de more dependent, if you need more help, then those goals tend to be something about preventing onset or progression of these like postural deviations like the scoliosis um, or um, helping to be more manageable so that if like the chair is higher, it might be easier to transfer out of, a bed, out of the wheelchair and into the bed or into a shower chair and be able to um, help with uh, activities of daily living. You can also um, help with promoting upright positioning, which can make it more possible to be active, um, but it can also help you be more alert and have better respiratory function and um, actually improve your GI and your bladder and bowel control. So it can uh, impact a lot of different things. And it's just important to, to make sure that whatever equipment you get can accommodate any other additional you know, equip medical equipment that you need. So if somebody is on a ventilator or needs added oxygen or has an IV pole, um, you want to make sure that your equipment can help you transport and keep that close at hand. Um, and then for the active user or the more active user, the equipment should really allow you to be able to use your trunk and your upper extremities for activities that you want to do. It might even be able to help you um, improve your neurological recovery. So as we were talking about earlier, it could help you with strengthening, helping you to go further and be more active. So it may um, be beneficial as from a rehabilitation perspective and not just from a getting around perspective. And there's a lot of different things. So maybe um, a child or an adult wants to be able to push with their arms um, and 
and uh, get more you know, engagement of their trunk muscles without having a lot of you know, extra support. And that can get them to be more active in their community, but it also might be more uh, tiring and it might be more to the advantage to be looking for a power chair that can give them more independence and be able to be out in the community and participate with their peers and not need so much assistance. So weighing those different goals is really important. Um, but the focus usually for the more active user is how can you get out and be more accessible in your community and have greater involvement. Um, and then there's a lot of different standing and gait equipment. And for this, we really want to improve quality of life. So uh, more time in the upright position, allowing you to make eye contact with your peers, um, keeping you more alert, giving you more independence. Um, you would have to have better, stronger trunk muscles than if you're sitting to be able to be standing. But this can also give you the advantage of being able to get some more um, aerobic exercise or activity. Um, and weight bearing through your legs is, can just be super, very beneficial for your bone density, um, for not having any uh, decrease in your range of motion, so not getting any joint contractures where you get stiff in a position and then you can't move out of it. Um, and then as I said, it can be really important for bladder and bowel function and, um, and your cardiovascular system overall. Okay, <clears throat> hi everybody. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about um, the goals for, so ADL stands for Activities of Daily Living. So this could be equipment that um, can be used in lots of different environments but are thought to be important or meaningful to you or, or your child. So um, as you can see, there are a couple pictures of different ways that, um, a, a different seating um, configurations, I guess, that can allow um, a person to enjoy being in a wet environment. Um, you know, ADL equipment um, helps to reduce risk of injury. Um, it gives um, help to caregivers um, during transfers and even to the patient during transfers. Um, provides kind of a solid base from which they can play from. Um, so it gives some independence to the child um, or adult who uses the equipment. Um, and, you know, oh, the overall goal, again, is to use equipment, if we have this newer technology, to use it to help improve their quality of life. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, so just to kind of go over a few things that I think are important to keep in mind and why seating and positioning even matters. Um, so the idea is to use equipment to increase their independence. Um, again, as I was saying, it gives people kind of a solid base to start from. So if your base is solid, then you can use your arms and, um, more effectively often, um, and you can be more engaged even cognitively. Um, a good seating and positioning gives safety um, to the person using the equipment. Um, it allows them to um, be within their home and interact in their community um, from a good vantage point. It also helps to prevent medical complications. So getting the right kind of seating position will av avoid um, issues often down the road. Um, it also, um, using proper seating allows for community access so they can, so people can get out and interact with others and participate in activities outside of the home. Um, you wanna keep in mind that um, uh, at children as well as teens and adults, we want to interact or be able to participate in activities that are age appropriate. And so using seating and kind of considering that seating will then change as, as we age um, to allow us to, the, to do the activities we're interested in. Um, and to keep in mind that you know being more mobile allows um, the user to have more fun, to be able to enjoy their life, and so using seating and positioning properly really gives them that avenue to do that. Um, and this is a, a picture that that I thought was um, useful to indicate you know why poor positioning could have really serious consequences. So you might have a, a uh, um, a cushion to sit on, but if it really doesn't help avoid um, orth orthopedic deformities or skin breakdown, then that, that seating um, equipment is not appropriate. And so it's really important if, if you don't know how to judge that to go to a professional to be, make sure you're getting and you understand why the, the seating configuration that was recommended is recommended. Um, so, uh, you know, you can also have 
consequences to GI, bowel and bladder function, just by the ways you sit for long periods of time. And if you're sitting in the wrong position or putting pressure on different areas in an unhealthy way, this really um, has, can have long-term um, consequences. It can com um, compromise cardiopulmonary function, so just the, the way you breathe. And, um, and in order to do activities, you need to be able to um, use your arms and, um, and legs, and this often will cause um, sort of stress and strain to your cardiopulmonary system. So you want, you want to make sure that you have enough space to be able to inflate your lungs and um, to participate in activities. Poor seating also, of course, can, can end up causing pain, even though the purpose of good seating would be to alleviate it. Um, I think the point of the slide is really just to be really aware that just because someone recommends a, prop, a seating position or a seating equipment to you, make sure you understand why this is important, and then observe um, how, that person, how, how that person's behavior changes as they use this equipment over time. Because um, you can see um, this, you know, the posture of this um, gentleman on the, on the table here didn't happen in a day or two, it happened over time. So, so even if you don't know if it's poor positioning, you can have observations that are really um, important important that could alleviate this. Um, so uh, there are seating clinics. Um, I guess we're showing a little bit, since we don't, since we can't show you actual equipment, we thought at least showing pictures of different kinds of equipment would be, might be insightful or helpful to you. Um, so on the left is um, a child in a standing, um, um, standing table, allows them to bear weight um, and participate um, in standing even when they are unable to do it independently. Um, uh, the middle picture is showing um, a, a gait trainer that allows, that provides a lot of stability to allow the child to be upright and mobile, um, but with, um, with, with some, um, with safety, safeguards and support. Um, and then on the right um, side is just a, a wealth, you know, a wheelchair that fits a child well, really allows them the independence to be able to participate in activities. We're gonna talk a little bit now about, um, you know, a little bit more about the details of seating and, and these are, can be dry. <laughs> but I will tell you, the really, I think it would, it's really helpful for you to, to understand some of it so that you can ask questions and, and, and kind of um, work with your um, uh, seating professional. So, so you might be asking, when do you even need a team evaluation? Because um, it might seem um, like the person is sitting fine in the wheelchair that they have or the, um, in the home. Um, but you might ask yourself these questions. So, so do you require a mobility device because maybe they've outgrown their existing mobility device? And you can sort of um, look for signs of that. Um, it, maybe the existing device that's being used isn't really appropriate or it doesn't work quite the way it was meant to over time. Um, that would, those would be good reasons to go, um, to need a new mobility um, or new seating system. Um, maybe you require a standing frame um, and uh, you need to make sure before you jump into to getting a standing frame that you have the space to store something like this. It's, it is a big piece of equipment. Um, and also uh, make sure that you or your child has no other way to do standing so that it really is the, be the next best step to assure that, this, um, that the person can participate in activities while standing. Um, a gait trainer or a walker, um, again, you have to be sure you have this, um, it, this is a bigger device. This is to allow more mobility. Um, and you have to be sure you have the space to accommodate this, this piece of equipment. Um, again, asking yourself the question, you know, there, is there any other way that they can ambulate? Or do they really need this kind of equipment to give them um, the stability and safety that they need? Um, you might also need a team evaluation not for mobility devices, but because um, the activities of daily living are really difficult right now, and some equipment might really offer some solutions for the care partner or for the person themselves. Um, it might be that you're looking for um, a way for the, um, the child or adult to um, get some exercise or participate in a family activity, and so an adaptive bicycle might be um, one thing you've been thinking of, and that's a complicated piece of equipment, so it would be really good to have a team evaluation to be sure you're thinking about all the, the necessary pieces to getting a safe piece of equipment for them. 
Um, so things you might want to think about if you decided, yes, we need to go get a, an evaluation, um, you might want to think about, um, you know, is this piece of equipment, do you have the space for it? And then do you have the time to devote to using it? And um, as you can see from the first line here, therapists that go to patients' home, uh, homes will often comment that there's a lot of equipment that isn't being used. Um, and so it collects dust. And so you just want to be sure before you jump into this that you've thought about where it can be stored and how you would be using it so that it, it is an important, uh, it is necessary and um, will add to the quality of life of the person using it. Um, it the other thing to consider um, is you want to make sure if it's a child that they're large enough to fit into a seating um, system or a stand or, or a gate trainer um, and make sure, um, and you know, this is something that your physical therapist or physician can offer some insight into as well. Um, now, to get a referral to go to um, a seating clinic, you first of all, you need to have a diagnosis that is fitting for um, requiring this. Um, you wanna make sure the, um, if, if the patient currently has equipment, you know what that equipment is. Um, and you want to understand what the problems are with the existing equipment, or are, they, is, are there positioning issues that are important? So have these things either written out or clear in your mind. Um, and then you want to consider what, which vendor you might want to use. And you might have used a, a vendor for equipment that you currently have, and just assess whether you still think that is the right vendor um, or not, because you can still change, um, and there, you know, there, are, there are options for that. So we're gonna go through now um, a couple of frequently asked questions that we thought might be helpful, but please, if you have other questions, we want you to um, definitely ask those as well. So um, first of all, you know, is it, one thing we thought of is, you know, is it good to go when you don't really know what you need? Um, so yes, um, so that's, that's the perfect time to go. When you're not sure what's appropriate to get professional advice and ask questions can open up doors and open up, you know, uh, to, so that you can learn about things you might not have known about. So this is, this is showing a couple of different types of walkers. Um, you might be familiar with this, um, the top left walker. It has kind of larger wheels, so it's easier to go over larger terrains. Um, but it's a four-wheeled walker versus the one on the top right is, is a three-wheeled walker. Um, they both have equally sized wheels, but one has four versus three wheels, and it would be good to just know that there are these options and what might be best for you. Um, and the bottom walker is actually um, a walker that you, that you walk with behind you, so the front is free and you hold on to it and the walker itself is behind you. And so there are other, that's a whole different configuration for a walker. So going to, to get professional help or to ask questions is really a good idea so you can learn about some of these things. Um, I'll just add to that. The one in the upper right corner with the three wheels, is like, it's one of my personal favorites. I always think I want one of these at some point in my life. Um, it has suspension like in a, um, in a, like a, a mountain bike. And so it allows you to go over like curbs and trails and things like that and make more accessible. Um, and then uh, as Kathy said, the posterior walkers are really nice. They, we often think of them mostly for children, but I often recommend them for adults if you are willing to consider one because it lets you get up closer to a support surface. It allows you to kind of stand up and have your hands free to do something and you have something behind you that keeps you from falling backwards. There's a lot of advantages to them, um, but they are a little bit wider than a typical walker and so your home has to be able to accommodate it, but it might be more useful at, for out in the community. So. Um, that I just wanted to put those ideas out there. Um, we also wanted to, you know, think about like, so you can, can you go to an equipment company if you already have a wheelchair that needs repair? Um, so yes, you can, I mean, for, well, so I guess I'm, I jumped ahead. So this is about, um, if you just need a part for your wheelchair or a piece of equipment, or you just need a repair, like uh, the adjustment of the seat back isn't exactly right, 
you want to, you don't really need to go through the whole equipment company or through a seating clinic. That'll be like a longer delay. You want to reach out directly to your vendor um, or your sales rep from that vendor and have them send out a repair person um, to your home or schedule an appointment to come to their location in order to have it repaired. Um, going through the seating clinic would, would probably slow down getting the repair done. Okay, um, another question might be, can I go to a seating clinic for new equipment while I'm also waiting to repair current equipment? So the answer is yes. You can have parts on order for current equipment, but also have a referral for a seating clinic at the same time. So you don't necessarily have to you know, wait or um, think you can only do one thing at a time. And I'm just, the picture is just showing you um, just different canes that might be um, cane or, or a walking stick. Um, we were just again trying to give you sort of ideas of things that um, we've seen in the clinic and um, um, make sure we're being, um, you know, that we, we share that with you. Um, so do you need to go to a specialty clinic for these devices or can you go to any therapist or physician? So we're talking from a perspective of a university center or a bigger city where you probably have access to um, a, a medical center that has, you know, um, maybe even, you know, demonstrations of a lot of different things. And ideally that would be great, especially if you have like a more complex system that you need, like a seating system, that would be great because they have experience, they'll be able to get through it faster. Um, they'll be able to give you a lot of different ideas. Um, the, uh, the only problem is sometimes the wait for getting in can be longer. Um, so that's another reason why we're kind of giving you all this information to start thinking ahead of the game. Because you can have an evaluation and have ready what it is that you want. And if you don't need it immediately, then you can be going to your uh, local therapist or physician and say, you know, okay, now is the time that I'm ready for this equipment and we already have it ready that we, we want to order. Um, you can also go to your local PT or your local physician or OT um, to help you make these decisions as well. And it really depends on the complexity of what you want to order. Um, and I just mostly or, you know, offer caution to, to not just choose something online you know, from Amazon. And um, you can do it if you can return it easily and try it out in the clinic, but, um, but you're spending a lot of money to do that. And so, um, so sometimes it's good if you can at least have a chance, the opportunity at a specialty clinic to try out some different different things that can give you a lot more experience. Okay, another question might be, do you, do you feel like your equipment provider ebbs and flows with, your, with their responsiveness to your requests? Um, so yes, that definitely, that definitely can be the case. Um, so this is part of why I think kind of knowing, having more information gives you sort of an advantage. Um, so understanding how you get a prescription for equipment um, and the way this typically works is after your um, functional medical evaluation, um, the vendor and your therapist will provide the physician with the equipment evaluation and a letter of medical necessity. And this will have the details of what they are really recommending um, and why that piece of equipment is important for this person. Um, it, so, it, um, and it provides a justification, and that's often really, really critical for support, for insurance support for that. Um, um, it's good um, to give your physician a reminder that this is coming and that it needs to be signed um, because uh, they are, typically very willing to do this, but they do, but they, but they have a lot of things on their plate. So um, kind of knowing this is the system, you can give them a heads up that, that this still needs to be signed by them before it can move forward. Oh, oh I just didn't, I'm sorry. <laughs> Two things at once, I can't do it, let's see. Um, okay. So um, the, uh, there's really important information that needs to be in that letter of medical necessity, and it's not your responsibility to put it in, but it doesn't hurt to know ahead of time what it is that needs to go in there. So, you know, what equipment you want and the diagnosis, um, but also like really itemizing why those things are needed. So like if you have decreased sensation, then you really need that important seating system that might be custom molded. And so that's important to have those, you know, 
things in there, but especially functional limitations. Like what is it that you can't do without this equipment? And what is it when you have this equipment you are able to do that those are make a big impact in whether or not your equipment gets funded. And very often you have to have tried different pieces of equipment and things that are less expensive in order to get the thing that is more expensive, which I know can be a struggle. And sometimes it can happen in a single visit, but um, it's important to be able to say either in maybe your local PT, if before you go to a seating clinic can have tried out like a standard front rolling walker and have written down that you need, you know, moderate assistance to walk with that. And so that's not appropriate. So you have extra documentation to back it up. Um, so that's why the like alternative, alternative or less expensive options can't work is what's uh, sometimes really important to have in your letter. Um, so, so it's often thought that you need three trials for equipment. Um, so this is not always the case, so it depends. Some vendors require for, standard, for standards or gate trainers um, that you complete three trials. Um, other vendors don't require this, these three trials, so it's good to ask and know what the standard is for them. So why even three trials? So um, some pairs require kind of proof that, that you can tolerate um, the a piece of equipment and there's evidence um, that multiple options have been tried and this is really the best option for the person um, and you've ruled out kind of other things that aren't as ideal. So, um, it's, so it's just good to know that that exists and to know that it's not a black and white standard for every equipment, for every um, vendor. Um, so is there a limitation in the amount of time that you have to have a piece of equipment um, before you can get a new one? Um, and like there isn't really a set time frame. It used to always be three to five years about, um, but uh, in like, I think it was around 2021, Medicare said that you had to actually wait five to seven years. Um, and so it's an important thing to keep in mind that you might have to keep, you know, making adjustments or modifications to your chair until uh, or your equipment until you're eligible for a new one. Um, however, it's really important to realize that if you have changes in like your progression of your disease or a diagnosis or you have like a change in your weight um, or your growth, that those are exceptions and they do allow you to get a new piece of equipment. Um, so just knowing that you're supposed to keep a, a piece of equipment for five to seven years, don't let that stop you from going to the clinic. They'll have the most up-to-date regulations, you know, that they're aware of and um, be able to better help you, you know, have support for needing something new. Um, kind of as I think Jen just explained much of this, so coverage rules for certain devices um, with certain pairs can change from year to year. Um, and she just gave the example of in 2021, um, there was the five to seven year rule and it was extended for certain things for cushion replacement. So, um, but by contrast, Medicaid for, had a rule for posterior walkers. They often need this letter of medical necessity to say why they cannot use an anterior walker. So they're going to look for a justification for why you want a certain piece of equipment, and this changes. So, um, so we can't give you guidelines, but it's really important that you look at, you really evaluate what your coverage options are, and you ask a lot of questions, because I think that is the way you'll get to the bottom of um, your, your best advocate advocate really for how to find some of these answers. The answers are out there, but they're just, they change a lot. Um, and similarly, uh, what what is covered and how it's covered also changes. So some um, some payers require prior authorization. Um, some insurance companies require you to take responsibility that you'll cover the cost of it if it doesn't get um, covered by insurance um, first, and they'll require it to be delivered before um, they'll pay the vendor, which does put you at greater risk of um, of, of owing it, uh, you know, of having to pay for a piece of equipment. So it's something to be aware of before um, 
before you're ordering. Um, and then there's policies that you know allow for a stander, but not for a bath chair or something like that. So it's uh, important to check your coverage policy for those things. And then also certain insurance companies will only contract with certain vendors, which I think you're sort of familiar with the same sort of in-network for your providers, um, but the same thing can be true for your vendors. And so before you make that equipment appointment, it would be good to know what your vendors are that would be that are usable by your insurance. Um, so then we just wanted to go over in a summary, like it's really important to work with a seating team if you have that available to you. And your seating team can be your local therapist or your physician, but it can also be at a major medical center. Um, and you wanna really identify what your seating and mobility goal, equipment goals are, so that can help you target, um, you know, what pieces of equipment um, would be most beneficial to you. Um, and as we've talked about, like know who your vendor um, can or should be um, and what your insurance coverage options are when you go into it. Um, and then um, getting the necessary evaluations done, um, whether that's three trials for something or just a good fitting, uh, you know, measurements and those kinds of things for the right seating equipment or, um, and then getting the right documentation in place before ordering. And just make sure you ask lots of questions. Um, and we would really like to thank the ULF for letting us um, share this information with you and to Meredith Linden who um, helped us prepare a lot of the content development for this talk for you today. So thank you very much. We'll take any questions. Thanks for sticking it out to the very end of the day. It's a long time to sit. <laughs> you can feel free to stand up and stretch and walk around if you ask questions too. <laughs> Okay, good. Okay, so our son Aiden is 26 and he's in a wheelchair full time. And we have discovered that he has a lot of pain in the bottom of his foot, plantar fasciitis. When we had his latest um, neurologist appointment, she was a little bit dismayed, like he's in a wheelchair full time, why would he have plantar fasciitis? I said, I don't know, but he does, right? Um, we do the stretches. He lives sometimes with us and sometimes at a assisted living facility, which is great to give us a break, mm -hmm. but he has nobody there doing stretches. I'm working hard to get that to change, but it's not changing yet. So potentially that is why this has happened. When he's home with us, he gets it at least once a day or maybe more. Maybe not this week, been a bit busy. But um, that being said, he has this plantar uh, pain in the foot. And we see a, a physiotherapist that um, is great for Nero. And so I talked about it with her and she gave me some things to work on. That being said, just doing the simple movement back and forth, and then I just even touch it, and it's hurtful for him. So she had suggested night splints that I could put on, so I went ahead on Amazon, because we live in a small town, and got them delivered just before here, tried it with him, and his heel doesn't even sit flat. So I don't know what to do with that. I'm hoping that maybe you have a suggestion. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> so um, I guess, uh, you know, I mean, so um, uh, there's a lot of different options out there, right? And so having had plantar fasciitis myself, I know how uncomfortable it is, which is just a nice thing to have. So there are um, a lot of different plantar fasciitis spine splints. So there are ones that go behind the foot, which is what I assume that you maybe purchased. They also make like a plastic splint that can go over the top of the foot. And then you just use like a Velcro strap around the the toe and the top and the, you know, more uh, higher up on the leg to kind of do it. I often find that what we try and do is 
get to the perfect thing in a in, right away. And what I sometimes find, and actually someone brought up the holistic perspective, I find sometimes really you just need to get out of like that end range position. So rather trying than trying to get him up to like a good where he's getting a real stretch, just keep him from getting to that end range and being at the very end the whole time. So like, is it tolerable to get just a little bit out of the end and see if that gives him some pain relief? It, it does require a long time. So the idea of overnight is a really, a really good option if like it's at all possible to put it on after he falls asleep. And so he might, you know, tolerate it a little longer. He might be a little more relaxed if it won't wake him up. That would be some things I would consider. Um, I would also recommend, you know, a physician appointment. There are some medications like Botox or like other, you know, oral medications that could be used. Um, and then there's the opposite end. So I know I'm saying like, you can just barely get them out of end range and that's good, but you can also go for like serial casting. So you cast the foot where he is and keep it on for a whole week and that prolonged stretch, you know, it, what it does is it weakens the muscle and it lengthens it and then he can be a lot more comfortable. But I'll say that based on what you said, I think he wouldn't be very comfortable in that cast at the beginning. So that might not be a really very good option. Um, and then you can, and I'm sure your physiotherapist has done this too, but um, breaking up tone further up the chain can sometimes be helpful. So if you can get more of a bend in his hip or his knee, then sometimes you can get the foot to relax. Um, and then there are things like TENS. So like this is like an electrical stimulation thing that you can put on the muscles that can kind of, they don't really, it doesn't, it's nothing you can feel, but it can also help the, the muscles relax that can give him some more range. You're nodding because you've tried all of these things. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, and I think, I guess what I'm trying to give you everyone as a perspective is there's a lot of options out there and you just need to keep trying until you, you know, if you can keep trying something, then that's really the way to go. Like don't give up because the first thing you tried didn't work. Um, and it it's a process, right? So just a little bit of progress you can get a little bit more, like so. It's sort of just getting that start. Don't expect big changes to begin with, and especially when pain is involved, because then it's really hard. It's that really affects his quality of life every minute, right? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it works. Uh, you're in Canada, right? But like for assisted livings here, like if your physician does write for a, a script that they have to have stretching once a day or whatever, that's like basically a medication. It does have to get done now technically whether or not it happens I know everyone's busy and that's not a lot but or if you can figure out a way to like build it into his daily care so that like every time they put his pants on they make sure that they move his foot up like some sort of routine exactly yeah, and in right. the children's hospital we actually post big pictures on the wall of like this is how you need to do it in steps and it really helps because it's just right there in your face and and you're kind of like oh and you know um, empathy does exist, especially in there. And so, you know, this will make me feel better. <laughs> and then that sort of, it can, it doesn't hurt as a reminder. Um, so. I also, I would like, you have to give yourself a little bit of grace that this is not, there's no quick fix and that you're doing everything you can. I think asking questions, talking about it makes everyone else aware of this too, because we're not, none of us are really immune to some of these issues. So uh, thank you for bringing it up. Other questions? Here. So everyone can hear. Sorry. She went from being on her toes. You want to with, this after the Botox, she was could stand. Just for listeners that might be not, so there, you used um, slow stretch, consistent stretch, and you found positive. 
along with the Botox and found positive results. Okay. That's great. Good success story. Anyone else want to ask or speak up? I'm just curious for anyone in the room, honestly, even Kathy and, and Jen too, when, when you're not, when you know you need a piece of equipment, but you're hesitant or reluctant to pursue that, how do you work through that and how do you help people? Like if they need a, a, a new piece of equipment, either because of disease progression or just changes to their body, but there's resistance to that how do you patients yeah patients resistance yeah. or especially if there's like family that wants to recommend or wants that equipment to be had but the patient doesn't want it yeah, to be really hard. it's hard I'm just curious how anyone's managed that does anyone want to respond from the personal perspective I would say talk to the physicians. Usually a physician, if they see that a patient's not doing well and they need a different type of equipment because their disorder has progressed or regressed, they would be the ones that would make the recommendations to the family, and the family has to follow what the physicians request. I was thinking of finding a motivation for that person so that they would, they themselves would want that piece of equipment. If you could sort of work it into making some part of their life or something that they want to do will make it easier if they use this piece of equipment. So it's not like you're forcing them to do something. They kind of see the rationale, the purpose, yeah. I don't know. Jen, do you have any suggestions? Uh, yeah, I feel like we get those question, that question a lot. I do think it sometimes, we were talking about something else, uh, about something else earlier, and somebody said, well, they don't listen to me, this person doesn't listen to me, and it does, I think as you're saying, like, getting the rest of the team sort of talking about it can be helpful, or asking it as a question of the provider when you're there together, like, you know, what do you think about this is happening, and what do you think about a way for us to address it, can sort of, like, you know, uh, make it, but if people really don't want it, you know, it, it it is a person's choice. Mm -hmm. um, I think one thing we've been finding in our research is that um, people who sway on the force plate when they're trying to stand still and they sway a certain amount, um, a population as a whole has either selected or found that they need a cane or a device if they start swaying to a certain amount. And so like, you know, me, I like some evidence. Like, well, I feel like I'm fine, I'm swaying, you know, but I can do it. But if I see that everybody else's, my numbers have gone up, you know, people at this, about the same level need a cane, then I feel like that kind of gives me more evidence. Oh, okay, well, I'm getting kind of close to the edge where, you know, and then when I use this cane, I can walk faster. Maybe I can cross the street quicker and I won't get stuck in the middle before the light changes or something like that. And then I think, I mean, um, you know, knowing about some of the risks, sometimes you don't know about what can happen with skin breakdown if you're not sitting appropriately. And so just making sure you have good education out there, I think can be helpful. But support groups seem to be really good too when your peers can tell you yeah, that's what they've idea. done, yeah. I think is, you know, is also really helpful. So um, what do, you, do you have an idea too? I know you should know. <laughs> so everyone can hear. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a physical therapist too, but it's, I was thinking from the perspective of like my dad and trying to give him recommendations and it's not always easy to give family recommendations, right? They feel like they're giving in, I need to f not give in to this disease, I need to not give in to this challenge, this problem, so I don't have any other recommendations, but I might, ang I might lean into the peer pressure for him, so that's a good idea. Thank you. Sorry, so some of you know I was a, well, I'm a pediatric neurologist, but I know I'm no longer seeing patients as of a year ago, but for good, for good reasons, I guess. But um, the peer pressure thing, I mean, I've been trying to convince my parents, and especially my father, to get hearing aids for about six or seven years, and this has been 
it, it was partly a pride thing for him, but I think with any kind of equipment it is. And so my cousins came over at Christmas and uh, they had gotten hearing aids. So they were carrying on a normal conversation and my dad didn't hear any of it. And then the next week he said, so it, I couldn't see the ones that Harvey had, like, do you think those would be okay for me or I don't want anyone to see, like he started actually finally talking to me about it because I think, you know, this was a, a peer of his that was a cousin that they hung around with when they were younger, young, you know. And so then it was, it was finally okay, but me nagging him, the fact that they were listening to TV at 60 something and then when they got their hearing aids, they could put it down to 20 something, you know, had totally escaped them, I think. But the peer pressure certainly did work. And I know that, you know, when, when I was still practicing, I, I worked with an absolutely amazing physical medicine team. And um, they would show the families how much fun the kids were having with the equipment, which meant I always had to kind of do this before I left my, my exam room, because there might be someone with a, a trying out a little reverse walker or something like coming down the hall with a ball ahead of them while they were trying really hard to chase that thing down the, ball, down the hall or whatever. And uh, it seemed to encourage families to say, you know, that gave them a lot more of this ability or that ability. And, um, and the agreement we had was whatever, you know, whatever the, the PTs and OTs wrote, they should do it with as much detail as possible so I could just sign it by the time I got to my office because I didn't know nearly as well as they did what would be best for all of the, for the kids or, you know, the teenagers and all of that. So, you know, I think that a lot of physicians sometimes when the reluctance seems to be more at that level, it's actually because, you know, we don't get trained how to do this. You know, these guys are the experts, right? And so if you're just asking your, for your, your physician for a new chair or something, they may, may be very intimidated by the fact that they don't understand how to order you a chair, what would be the components of a chair that might work, you know, or whatever. And so, you know, the more detail by asking questions of your therapist that you can um, give the physician on a prescription or a letter or whatever, the more likely they are to easily sign it and do the work that's needed to get past the insurance. But it is intimidating, to be honest, for physicians to get asked for equipment, you know. That's a really good point. Because that's part of why we were emphasizing how things change. So it's hard to keep up with the changes, especially if that's not your primary role, right? So seating clinics, that's what they're supposed to be good at. So they should be keeping up with the way the rules and laws change. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, it's even intimidating to us, right? Because yeah. there's no equipment out there all the time. But I would also add that you should know if you're going to make that big trip to a university center and you think that you're going to get a seating equipment, when you come to Kennedy, which is where I work, uh, for a leukodystrophy clinic, that is not part of that visit. And if you want that, you should plan and schedule that at the same time ahead of time. Like, you could, if you want it at the same time, you're going to have to do a lot of coordination. So I just wanted to warn you, like, sometimes I, I maybe we didn't, you know, talk about that but it can be a three month or more wait for that appointment. So like making sure that, you know, you go and you also should expect that you are not gonna go home with that piece of equipment when you go there. You're gonna find out what it is you need and that'll be the first step in the process to getting all this paperwork, which I'm very sorry that that's the way it all goes, but that is just a heads up. You don't really wanna show up there and expect to leave with it, so. You said it's a two-year waiting two list? Year. It's a two-year. And that's just to say, yeah. hi. Yeah. And then months later, you might get the molding done. And now we're at another, you know, few months to wait. And then Aiden finally gets his new chair, and it's almost time for a new one. Yeah. Not, I mean, not new chair, but right. things have changed over the course of that many years. Yeah. So... Other questions or things we didn't address that maybe we should have? <laughs> or things you'd like to hear about next year if we're asked to come back? <laughs> yes, do you want to actually see actual equipment? Like, well, I mean, it's hard for us to bring equipment here, but like, I feel like pictures of stuff is kind of hard to just get a good idea of what that is, but I, 
I'm not sure if there's a good way, if there's something like you want more hands on, like how do you do this or what would be good? Or is this kind of a good, like, you know, lead into where you're headed? I guess I could say since you guys have experience, like what do you wish you knew <laughs> before? Have you seen or worked more with the easy stand that actually aren't just the standard that actually move? Yeah. yeah, I like those. The ones that you can either, they have ones that you can move with the joystick controller so you can be more upright and get through your environment and stay. And then they also have ones that are for like exercise, right, that you can move the feet back and forth. I have really good experience. I do have a, a young adult, I don't know, he's almost 29, so I guess he's just an adult, um, who has a lot, though, of tone, and he has broken that thing, like, I can't even tell you how many times, I feel like every time I go over, they have them coming back out to make adjustments, but honestly, when he's in that, and he's been moving around a little bit, he looks so much better, so it's been worth the, it's not that the equipment is bad, I think he's really hard on it, so it's kind of a, you know, something just to keep in mind, you know, too, but um, if it's appropriate, I think they're they're good. I know there's, I know that it's been out for a while, because um, when we go to physical therapy, they have a lot of nice machines, but some of them, they tell you, well, insurance is not going to pay for this, you know. Um, and then there are a couple that they do pay for, but it's like, like, it's almost like Canada is going to be three years before you're going to, and then, by the time you get it, there's something new out again. But a lot of them, people don't even know about. Her, she, her physical therapist, I was trying to explain to her, and I didn't even know the name, because she had did it in physical therapy last year. And I was trying to explain to her what it, I said, the, the feet move, but it's an easy stand. She said, I haven't, I haven't worked with one. And then finally she looked it up, and then she got one, but the one she got, the arms have to move simultaneously with the feet, which Kirsten can't do. <laughs> so even though she got it and Kirsten tried it, it wasn't exactly the machine for her, and she can't keep getting mach more machines in. But there are a lot of new ones, and um, I was just curious if you guys have worked with some of those new machines. It's hard, right, because they are changing a lot. So um, I think it's good that you asked your therapist and tried to get them to kind yeah. of explore because that's, I found myself doing that a lot after a treatment of like going and looking things up because I can't keep up with everything. Yeah. So. I don't know if you have, so in our state, in Maryland, there actually have been a number of groups that have started forming where if you no longer use your equipment, you donate it to them and then they will donate it to whoever needs it. And it's definitely worth it if you can even trial some things like that. Like um, some of them will let you take it home and tr you know keep it and try it for a short period of time and you can donate it back. You know. Um, if they've, yeah, it's, yeah, and also I think for donating your own equipment when you've gone through it, like, you know, it's, otherwise it does pile up in your garage and gather dust and, you know, like everything else, so, or become your laundry rack. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks well, thank everybody you. for sticking yeah. it out. <laughs> Maybe that stays there.